welcome back to the FNZ 90 Plus 3 podcast where three football supporters take a look into the dressing room, chatting to former professional footballers about their experiences on and off the pitch. I'm your host, Ashley Simons. If you fancy yourself as a bit of a CEO like Armchair Andy, then why not give us a follow on LinkedIn? Just search FNZ Football. You'll also find myself and Tux on there, so if you want, want to connect, just give us a shout. You can't be a good connection. Isn't that right, Tux? Yeah, that's the... Um... Facebook of business these days as it's referred to so uh, yeah that's where we got our latest guests from yeah so we're gonna have to to change the uh, name of the podcast tonight because there's only two of us we're you know we're out on our own you know uncharted waters for us it is very much uncharted waters um I don't know what's happened to the other two uh they've gone AWOL I think um yeah unreliable we'll get through we'll get through Anyway, let's go on to tonight's show. Tonight, we have a champion in the hot seat, a player who won it all with Celtic. And not only that, went on to play in the Champions League and Premier League. He was part of the famous Wigan Athletic side that beat Man City in the FA Cup final. Not only that, he then guided Wigan to promote the championship as well. His former Scottish international, Gary Coldwell. Gary, welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you, lads? Yeah, very good. good. Thanks, mate. Gary, as you're new to the show, you won't be familiar with the format, so let me set the scene for you. Just imagine you're in a pub and you've had one too many beers and you're willing to share your best stories with the guys at the bar so they can get you another drink. Is that okay? That's fine, yeah. It would be, it would be better if I had had a drink, but <laughs> I'll, I'll go with it. <laughs> a bunch mate, of drink. If, if you need to make a detour to the fridge, mate, you know, be my guest. But, uh, no, so no take it away, mate. So, yeah, thanks, Ash. Uh, Gary, it's a pleasure to have you on the uh, FNZ 90 plus two tonight. Uh, before we head on to your professional career, I just wanted to take you back to your days as a young boy growing up in Scotland and how your first interaction with football came about. I mean, whether that be following the team you supported or games you watched on TV, just sort of give us a, a, you know, an insight as to where, where it all started for you. I think it would all started from my dad. My dad was a, a junior player, an amateur player. Uh, and me and my brother would, would go and watch my dad when we were very young. He actually won the Scottish Junior Cup with a team called Bonus United when I would have been about three, I think, two or three. And we were actually, he's got a picture of us on the open top bus going through Bonus after, you know, winning the cup. Uh, I don't quite remember, obviously, watching it, but he was kind of our introduction to football. And then I was, I've was i always said I was very fortunate. I had an older brother who was an extremely good football player, uh, and I kind of learned from him uh, the, the kind of challenges he had, the mistakes he made. I was fortunate that I could then follow him and learn from him, uh, and we helped each other uh, throughout our career. But in terms of our early life, we used to play out the back, uh, got in trouble loads of times for playing out the back when it was wet, cutting up all the grass, uh, saying it wasn't us, uh, trying to get away with it. And then as we got older after school, we would go around the, the school, actually had uh, goals and we used to, we took our own nets. We used to put nets up and just maybe, I don't know, 10, 12 guys would, you know, young boys would, would come round and we'd just kick a ball every night, all night. And, I think that's the sad thing about kind of society now and, and life now for young children that they miss out on that. That you know, I would I, when I was 10, 11 year old, my oldest son's 13, my youngest, my younger boy's 10, my little girl's seven. When I was those ages, I would I would be out the house when I got in from school and you know, around the park and, and not to be seen. And my mum would actually have to come calling us to, to get us home. So I think nowadays, you know, to miss out on that and obviously with Xboxes and different things and uh, that's what's kind of gone from from kids' lives. But uh, I had a brilliant, you know, upbringing and, and kind of football was a huge part of our family life uh, from very early on. So was there a team that you supported or followed, like from a, you know, family traits or something like that? Yeah, I was a, a Celtic supporter. My mum's side of the family were big Celtic supporters. My uncle Thomas actually ran a bus, a supporters bus from uh, a, a local pub from, from where my mum grew up. Uh, so when I signed for Celtic, you know, that was a big thing for, for that side of the family. My dad wasn't really a supporter of a team as such. He was more a supporter of football. So we got to different games as well whilst... With my uncle, we'd go to Celtic games. We'd also go to, you know, Falkirk games or my dad's, you know, he was when he was playing for Bowness or different junior teams would go to their games. 
uh, and he really brought us up to to support football and and, and watch good football and uh, that's what that's what we've always done. But Celtic was our kind of uh, our team as we were younger, both of me and my brother. Yeah, so uh, just sort of focusing on that youth career then. So include that included spell obviously at Newcastle United. Uh, a massive club for you know a young man making his way in the foot in the world of football. Anyway, um, what was it like coming through the ranks and obviously making that move from Scotland to England? Yeah, it was brilliant. It was actually between my, my brother had already signed, Stephen had signed for Newcastle, and I was at that point going to Newcastle and Liverpool. Uh, Steve Highway was the academy manager at Liverpool at the time. He was a fantastic man and a, a great coach, and they had a really good youth set up. Uh, and Newcastle uh, had the draw of kind of my brother, and the manager there was Kenny Dalglish. The youth team coach was Alan Irvin, another Scotsman. The reserve team coach was Tommy Craig, another Scotsman. So there was real strong links uh, to, to kind of Scotland and, and home. Uh, for me at Newcastle and that was really what swayed my decision to go and, and sign for Newcastle and I left school at 16 uh, and went down and, and played football and really it was you know to leave school and, and go and do your hobby basically as as a job and, and try and make a career out of it was, was such a great thing to do. Yeah so you know you touched upon there um, you know many of our listeners may not know that you were also coming through with your older brother Stephen um, so, you know, of course, he had a, a successful career himself. So talk me through your relationship with him. I mean, you know, it's two brothers, two centre-backs, uh, two passionate players. Was it a case of brotherly love on and off the pitch or was it a competition and rivalry between, you know, you both from a very young age? I don't think it was ever competition. Obviously, competition, we would push each other on, but it was never, you know, never wanted to get one over each other. It was always... Uh, real support for each other and I think like I said for me it helped probably more than him because I could learn from his experiences he always had to go first to to try and achieve something so when he played for Scotland schoolboys then then my kind of aim was always set by him I think it's always more difficult to do it first so uh, I was fortunate in that regard but you know still to this day we phone each other every you know every day nearly, but if it's not every day, it'll be every couple of days. Uh, and all we talk about is football. He's over in Toronto now. He finished his career out uh, in the MLS and then uh, got into the kind of business side of the the club out there and then does stuff with TV now, punditry, and also works with the Canadian national team as, as assistant manager. So uh, we still discuss football, you know, all the time when we speak and uh, it's still a, a huge part of the family that, you know, that is our main sport and, and what we, we discuss all the time. Yeah, I remember him being a, a really good centre-back. Um, so, yeah, just touching back to Newcastle again in the early 2000s, um, you are on the fringes of the first team at St James's Park, uh, but ultimately never made an appearance uh, where multiple loan spells shortly followed at Darlington, uh, Hibernian, Coventry and Derby. Um, how frustrated were you with the lack of opportunity at Newcastle? But equally, what were the benefits from each of those loan spells that you had? Oh, first of all, looking back, uh, Bobby Robson was the manager at the time and it was just a, a privilege to be managed by probably one of the greatest English managers of all time uh, and didn't really fully appreciate it. 19 year old, 18, 19 year old and, and I wouldn't say I thought I knew everything, but I wanted to progress my career. I wanted to play. I wanted to be in his team. Um, and when he said I wasn't good enough and he would point out everything, he would say, you need to be quicker on the turn. You need to be better with the ball. And he, he would just be so honest, but in a way that, you know, you, you took on board. Uh, he was so passionate about the game. Uh, and, and at that point, I said, well, I want to play, I want to go on loan. And he was like, yep, on you go then. You know, you can go on loan. And I, I almost kind of kept hassling him and pestering him to, if I didn't play there, I wanted to play. And that was a big thing for me because I see a lot of young players nowadays who, you know, play for the bigger Premier League clubs and they don't have that desire to go out and loan. And I think it's such an important thing to get that experience of league football. My first loan at Darlington, for instance, my, my very first game, 
was a midweek game. I, I hadn't trained with the team. I turned up on the Wednesday night for the game. First time I met my teammates and, and was in the team, played the game. And the very first action, I brought the ball down on my chest, took it away for the centre forward and, and played a reverse pass into midfield. And the midfielder looked like he hadn't seen a football in his life before and didn't know what to do with it, got tackled and, and they broke and nearly scored. And the manager was going ballistic at me from the side. And I was 17 at the time. I looked over thinking, you know, what I've done there is, is pretty good. Uh, you know, I, I had I, as I had been taught. Uh, but he pulled me after the game, uh, before the Saturday game, and he took me on the training pitch and he, he started passing the ball into me. He said, take a touch and just leave it in the channel. So he must have, I must have put about 30 balls in this channel. And every one, he was going, brilliant, brilliant. Just leave it in there, leave it in there. He said, every single time you get the ball, put it in there. So I, I'm thinking, as a young boy, you know, wanting to know, wanting to learn. I said, what if there's nobody there? He said, don't worry, someday will be effing running there. <laughs> and that was, that was my kind of introduction to football where you had to win. I remember the centre half I played with was a guy called Dave Brightwell. Uh, he was older player at the time and used to come in every game with ice packs on his face, on his leg, on his knees. And I was kind of looking at him thinking, bloody hell, you know, what, what is he doing? You know, why is, why is his body like that? Only to, for me to realise when I was 30 odd, that, that was me, you know, coming in with ice packs all over you because his body had been through so much uh, throughout his career. I was young and, and, and kind of had that energy and no pain in my body. And uh, it really was a great introduction to, to professional football and, and the demands of professional football. And, and I, I loved that experience, but then wanted to continually improve and go to bigger clubs and better clubs and get more experience. So that was why I kind of then went to Hibs and then Coventry and Derby uh, and got those experiences of different leagues and uh to get released from Newcastle, having played over, well over 100 games, was a, was a big thing for me because I then was allowed to then go and, and get a good club in, in Hibernian and up in Scotland and uh, kind of really start my career there. Yeah, so that takes me on to uh, my next point. So, obviously, eventually leaving the Geordies uh, when you re-signed for Hibs, uh, this time permanently, obviously. Um, so, talk me through your time there and the appeal of, obviously, returning home to Scotland. Well, I'd been there on loan before, so that was the big kind of... I loved it uh, when I was on loan there and when I got released. The, the aim was to go somewhere where I was going to be playing, where I was in the team, uh, and not kind of go to another English club where you might not get in the team and your career stalls again. So I went up to Hibs and uh, it was Bobby Williamson was the manager. It was a, a manager who came in at the back end of my first spell there. Uh, and I'd had kind of good relationship with him, so went there uh, and and loved my time at Hibs. Both times I was at Hibs, still go back to the club. I think it's a fantastic club. Uh, but I was fortunate, I think, that in that period, the second time, Tony Mowbray came in, and he was a young manager with a different idea of playing the game and uh, really kind of lent on me and, and used me as, as the kind of the ball playing centre back to, to get the team playing and uh, he was a, a brilliant uh, manager for me at that time to help develop my career and give me the confidence to, to go and play the way that, that he wanted the game to be played and we were a brilliant young team uh, we had Scott Brown Kevin Thompson Gary O'Connor Derek Reardon uh, Stephen Whitaker you know, players that all went on to play at a higher level for bigger clubs uh, and, and have great careers. So we were a really good young team at that point. Right, so Gary, you went back to your, well, you went to your boyhood club, Celtic, and uh, I believe you signed a pre-contract agreement. Um, you were very much a versatile player at the time that could play in, you know, a number of positions. Do you think that it took some time for the fans to adapt to you as a player when you signed for Celtic? And just tell us about how, how, you're, how you signed for Celtic in the first place. Well, the first initial contact was obviously through your agent. Celtic showed an interest and then uh, Gordon Strachan wanted to, to meet me 
uh, and I, I lived in a flat right in the centre uh, of Edinburgh, and he came round the house one night with a, a hat, Tammy hat on, covering, you could barely see his face, and a big jacket, and, and came in, in the house, had a chat to me for about an hour and a half, and uh, another another manager who I was so fortunate to to come across and to work with because he probably more than anyone took my game to to another level in terms of the demands he put on me, the 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 physical, you know, the the fitness that I gained working under him because I thought I was working hard, but he was someone that always asked for more. He used he got rid of the heart rate monitors at Celtic because he said. The heart rate monitors only went up to 100% and he wanted people working harder than that. And that, that sums him up that he constantly demanded more from you and pushed you to be better than you were. And I still speak to him to this day for advice on coaching, on management. Uh, a fantastic football person. So he came round and kind of didn't need to sell me Celtic, but, you know, introduced himself and we, we had a chat and, and straight away I was, I was obviously eager to sign but had had six months less in my contract. I was in a position where I could sign a pre-contract but still had to obviously play the season out for Hibs and again with Tony Mowbray in my relationship I, I kept him in the loop all the time. I never done anything behind his back. I said look I've got the potential to sign a pre-contract. He said you have to do what's best for your career. We want you to stay but we understand. So when I signed I told him and it was a Thursday I signed and I told him and he said how do you feel? I said, I'm, I'm obviously buzzing, but he said, how do you feel about Sartre? Did you want to play? And I said, yeah, I want to play. You know, I'm still, I'm still a Hibs player. I want to do my bit for the team. So he said, not a problem. The, the, the disappointing thing or the thing that really made it difficult for that game was it got announced in the newspaper on, on the Saturday morning that I had signed a pre-contract agreement. Then I come out as Hibs captain for the game on the Saturday. And the very first time I got the ball, the whole stadium booed. The whole stadium kind of showed their uh, dissent at, at me signing for Celtic. And then to make matters worse, I made a, an error for the goal after about 10 minutes, a short pass back, and, and somebody scored. So that was a really difficult moment. But the manager came out after and was fantastic in the, in the way he stuck up for me and, and backed me and, and said to the fans, he's wearing a half shirt, he should be uh, supported and, and backed and told that as, as kind of otherwise. And, and I stayed for the rest of the season and uh, seen out the season and played even had to play against Celtic one game, which was, again, very difficult. But I think all these experiences, you know, you get through, you learn from them. And, you know, if, the, if they don't kill you, then they make you stronger. So uh, it was probably a good thing in preparation for going to Celtic. Yeah, so obviously you went to Celtic and not only did you, you know, make some notable appearances for him, but you, you obviously captained the side, but you didn't just captain Celtic. You went on to captain the Scottish national side as well, making 55 appearances for the Scots on the international stage. It's been a challenging time for Scotland over recent years to qualify for the big tournaments, but you have had a hand in one of the most memorable victories, scoring the only goal against France in the Euro 2008 qualifier at Hands of Park. What was it like to play on the international stage firstly, and not only that, to captain your country? Yeah, every, every, I'd say the pinnacle in my career actually was was kind of playing for Scotland, captain in Scotland, obviously the France goal. I said at the time I wanted to to do something bigger than that uh, and that would have been qualifying for a major finals. It didn't happen. So, you know, looking back on my career, the France goal is the biggest moment. But loved playing for my country. Uh, would always kind of turn up no matter how I was feeling physically. I think a lot of times you get pressure for your manager or, or your club uh, and, and sometimes people don't turn up for friendlies and different things. But I was somebody that whenever I got that call, I was ready to, to go and give my best for my country and uh, loved every one of the 55 caps, even though, you know, it was a difficult period. We, we struggled. That campaign, the 2008 campaign, was without doubt the highlight where we were very close to qualifying from an unbelievably difficult group of Italy, France and Ukraine. And, and we still managed to finish third in that group and just miss out on, on the playoffs and qualifications. So uh, it was challenging, but 
hopefully now we've we've got a group of younger players that you know with Andy Robertson leading them, playing at Liverpool magnificently well, and uh, being the captain now, he can he can hopefully get a, a newer generation. You look at Billy Gilmore, uh, and hopefully these players can can start to come to the fore and and take Scotland to a major final soon. Yeah, completely agree. Not many players can boast that they've played against the best players in the world. Uh, the sheer thought of any one of us being within two yards of Lionel Messi would just be incredible. You have, in fact, not only played on the same pitch as Lionel Messi, but at the new Camp as well. Tell us what it was like to make the Champions League knockout stages. And not only that, but actually playing the Champions League. Yeah, at the time, you're, I think at the time in football, you're just in the bubble. The football is such a... A bubble where the the world outside football almost is irrelevant, and you know now that I'm I'm kind of out of football, so to speak, in terms of not playing and can can see different things in the world. You are so single minded and driven that you don't even appreciate those experiences uh, at the time. You're just you're just uh, almost pre programmed to train, to eat, to rest, to play, and 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 you just go through the same process. Uh, week after week, day after day, uh, and that you know it's probably what you need to do. But you you miss out on kind of savoring those experiences. Now that I've got kids, when when I talk about it, you know they watch football, they love football, and I tell them I played against Messi or Neymar or Ronaldo, and they obviously see me in the park now, and I can hardly move. I've got. <laughs> Two false hips, and they, they kind of look at me as if to say, "You sure you done that?" But uh, it would have been great to do that, and they could have seen it as well. And and because of my injuries, I had to kind of my career was cut pretty short, and none of them can really remember watching me playing football. Uh, they, they they remember me more as kind of being a manager and uh, coming to games with me, scouting games and watching stuff as a manager rather than the player. But uh, Special memories that uh, I will always remember, and and playing at those stadiums against those players was was a real privilege. Yeah, so obviously you talk about your career there, and you, there was a real you know purple patch, I'd say, in your career. And that at that point, that same season, you picked up a number of personal accolades for your performances, but on the pitch there was there was only one player who featured more times than just yourself at Celtic in the 07 08 title winning side. Can you remember who that was? Uh, Arthur Boric? No. It's actually, <laughs> if I say it was Stephen McManus. What was it? But, yeah, I was going to say him or Arthur, to be fair. Yeah, I mean, under the guidance of Gordon Strachan, you went on, on to lift the uh, Scottish Premier League title. Uh, tell us what it was like. Are, are there any special memories to go with that? Yeah, I think the the best one for me would have been the the Dundee United away. Uh, the the league actually got uh, put uh, later because Rangers had done so well in the Europa League. It was the year they got to the final, and we uh, pl- the last game was on a Thursday night. But our coach and a and a club legend, Tommy Burns, had died that uh, season, and we had his funeral that week, and then we obviously led up to the game, but. I'd never played a game where where I knew we were going to win more than that one because it was almost felt like fate. Uh, we had been miles behind with seven games to go and had to beat Rangers twice uh, and win every game. I remember that in the last to. 10 games because you, you, you struggled to beat them earlier on in the season, isn't that right? And then the last 10 games, you beat them twice. We did, yeah. We, I think we drew it home to somebody and I remember the manager saying, you know, like, He's, he's have maybe blown this and he said but he says you have got it in you to win every game and that was typical Gordon Strachan to, to kind of question you and say can you do this and we beat them in the home game uh, and then the, the, the second game was a, a night game and it was an incredible atmosphere and we scored in the last minute of that game as well uh, and then momentum and, and with Tommy dying and his funeral was, was one of the most incredible things I'd ever seen the amount of people that came out uh, for his funeral and then we went up to Tannadice and, and won one nil. N- never played great but just when you're in those kind of moments and momentum and everything's with you uh, you just feel like you know you're going to win and we had players that could 
grind out results and, and produce moments. Jan Benagora Hesslink scored a goal and you know, we had players like him that just in big moments could could turn up and we managed to do that and it was just a brilliant it was about three days I think we were out <laughs> as a team. <laughs> Gordon Strack and we actually stopped. There's a big Tesco on the way back from Dundee and he pulled up, got went into the Tesco with with some money, trying to get a big, you know, cargo of beers and champagne and everyone for the boys. So uh, it was a brilliant few days, and that was my most memorable title that I remember, and uh, for so many different reasons. Yes. Yeah, so during your time at Celtic, your four years at Celtic, you made 150 appearances and helped the club to two league championships, a Scottish Cup and a Scottish League Cup. You were part of an ever-present but successful Celtic side and tasted victory from all angles. So. Tell us, how did it go from that to your eventual departure from the club? Well, Gordon left. The, with the following year, we lost the league on the last day of the season, which was probably the biggest low point. Uh, we, we drew away to Hibs in the second last game of the season, which put it in Rangers' hands. They played Aberdeen away, I think, and we were at home at Hearts, and we drew the game one, one, one each or nil nil, and Rangers won, so we lost the league. and A massive low point. In, in my time because if you finish second in Glasgow then then it's not good enough uh, and then Gordon left and the club changed Tony Mowbray came in which I thought was going to be great having worked with him before and then it just never quite materialised I was in the last year of my contract uh, the, the discussions with that the club had the valuation I had the valuation and it, and it wasn't you know close uh, and, and Tony would, was struggling to kind of Get get my 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 kind of my deal that I wanted, uh, so it was almost just kind of came to a an, an inevitable con- conclusion where I was going to leave the club. And in the January, Gordon Strachan had been moved to Middlesbrough. He came in for me, and I was very very close to signing. I'd I'd done a medical. I was I, I should have actually been signed, and then Roberto Martinez came in at the last minute from Wigan, and uh, I changed my mind and, and went to Wigan and. Uh, I always wanted to play in the Premier League. That was even the law was at Celtic and loved it and Champions League and everything that, that it kind of came. I felt like I'd won the league, I'd won the Cups, I'd played in the Champions League. I did want that taste of what's the Premier League like? What is it like playing week in, week out against these players and uh, challenging yourself at that level? So uh, when that opportunity came, I was delighted to, to sign for Wigan and and I know I get a kind of I got another education of football uh, from another brilliant manager as well at that time. Um, obviously, uh, your time at Celtic came to an end and then obviously you joined Wigan. You know, had the opportunity to nearly join Middlesbrough, but obviously opted to join Wigan, um, where you obviously linked up again with uh, your brother Stephen. Um, so, obviously, that reason, obviously, playing with your brother again is probably a good one, but other than that, I mean, you obviously touched upon your, you know, the, the chance to play Premier League football. But why Wigan? Why, why that? Why that club? Well, there wasn't many Premier League clubs in for me at that time. Wigan were one that I think at, by that point I'd kind of I was a ball playing centre back. Every team I'd played for, my attributes were bringing the ball out, passing. I wasn't the quickest. Uh, I was an aggressive defender, but I wasn't a great 1v1 defender. So I was always going to have to go to a club that played the style of football that Roberto Martinez wanted to play. And the first time I met him, he spoke about playing a three at the back, playing me in the middle. Uh, because of my lack of pace, that would kind of cover that. I would get quick players round about me. I could organise and I could bring the ball out uh, for defence and get us uh, passing the ball and, and playing good football. So uh, it was an easy choice once, once obviously, they came back in after Middlesbrough. And it was a different challenge. I remember the first day's training, I thought, what have I done? Because at Celtic, we were like, training was like a game. It was, in fact, it was probably more intense than some games that we played. There was tackles, people would get cuts, there would be kind of blood in people's eyes. It was full blooded training. And I went to Wigan, we actually trained in the stadium my very first day. And it was like pedestrian. People were walking. And then I remember I just in one of the games I went I went through someone in a tackle and everyone kind of thought, 
you know, what's going on here? But that was probably one of the reasons that Roberto signed me, that I had to change the culture. I had to be the one in the dressing room that set standards and, and the demands had to go up. Uh, so I was, I was kind of, that's what I had been used to and that's what I tried to, to bring to Wigan. Yeah, so before we move into uh, more about your time at Wigan, um, you just touched upon obviously playing for you know, managers such as Roberto Martinez, uh, Gordon Strachan at Celtic, Tony Mowbray at Hibs and Celtic, uh, obviously, and then Sir Bobby Robson um, at Newcastle. So out of those four or any other managers that you've had to play under, I mean, who would you say has been the manager that's had the most impact on your career as a player? I think the two that have had a big impact have been Gordon and, and Roberto for for different reasons. Gordon, like I said, took me to another level at a time. I was kind of mid, early 20s, 23, 24 maybe, uh, and pushed me to, to another level. Uh, but then Roberto uh, was was different in a sense that I was 28. I, I had come from obviously a big club in Celtic and playing Champions League. But it was his way of coaching, his way of dealing with players, the, the style of play, the belief in the style of play uh, that really impacted me. Probably not as much as a player, but more as, as a coach and, and how I then would go into coaching and management and, and the style of play that, that I believed in because he, he would not change. We would go to Anfield or Old Trafford and he would not change. We, we played the way we played and we tried to dominate teams with the ball. And quite often we actually did, and and probably more often than not we get beat, you know, two or three nil away from home because what you find at that level is you get punished, and and top teams with top players, strikers, when you make a mistake you get punished, and we would go to Old Trafford. I remember one game we went, we played it extremely well, probably had about sixty odd percent possession and got beat four nil, and after the game you're like, how did that happen? And it's just because these teams have such quality but over time we got better we got a slightly better calibre of player and when he changed to three at the back we became quite unique at the time nobody was really playing three at the back when we'd done it back in 2012 it would have been I think he, he was brave we were bottom of the league and, and he changed and I remember at the time thinking wow this is this is brave and our first game we drew three all with Blackburn and we were all over the sh- shop we didn't know the you know the the positioning or or how we were to mark and it took time but once we we signed Jan Bosajur in the January from Birmingham I think he was at and he was like the final piece in the jigsaw because I think to play three at the back the wing backs are the the kind of problematic position that they need to be specialist players that understand the position and the role if the, the three at the back is a little bit different for, for two at the back, but you can coach that. The, the, the wing backs, I think, are specialists. I and mean, when we got him in and had Emerson Boyce on the other side, we became a, a, a brilliant team uh, and really caused teams problems uh, with, with how we played. Yeah, so you um, made captain of the club and became a key figure in beating relegation uh, in your time at Wigan. Uh, but obviously one standout memory... I'm sure you have. It's the uh, 2013 FA Cup win over Man City. Um, you know, a proper David and Goliath contest, if you like. Um, I can still remember Ben Watson's headers hitting the net as, as Wigan went on to unexpectedly win the final. Uh, but what were your memories from the day itself and obviously winning in such a dramatic way against an opponent like Mancini's City side? Uh, I was obviously on the bench. I was injured at that time. Uh, my hip problems had been going on for for probably over a year at that point and was taking injections just to train and get and get through the day. Uh, so I was on the bench for the final and just remember Ben was on the bench as well. He had come back from two broken legs, which was, was incredible, the, the work he put in uh, to get back fit as well in such a short period of time to break your leg twice. I think it was in less than a year. Uh, shows you the kind of the type of character he is and, and the player that he is. But for him to come on and score the goal uh, was a, a special moment for, for the football club, for the town, uh, and something that, although we got relegated that season, I think 
you know, to, to have that memory and, and for the a team like Wigan, the story that it had to, to win an FA Cup is quite unique. Uh, there's not many in Wimbledon, probably kind of similar type story. Uh, but unbelievable day and, and something that uh, I'll always be proud of being part of that team. Yeah, so you ended your playing days at Wigan in 2015, uh, where you then joined the coaching staff. Uh, it was only a few months later when you became the manager of the club after the sacking of Malky Mackay. Uh, despite the team suffering relegation that season, you galvanised the players and managed promotion back to the championship at the first attempt. Um, so you also won the Manager of the Year award in that season. So, I mean, totally through your first steps into management and obviously, you know, the success that came with that at Wigan. I think I was fortunate. It's, management's extremely difficult and I had been at the club for so long. I understood the football club, the people at the football club and that's, for me, one of the biggest challenges in my, my, my next two jobs was that, was trying to kind of work that out whilst you're trying to win games of football is very difficult. But I almost went into the job knowing that at Wigan. But I didn't have that to deal with. I also had brilliant staff round about me who helped me uh, because I don't think you're ever ready to be a manager uh, and you have to kind of learn on the job. But what I was clear about in that period was how, how I wanted the team to look, how I wanted the team to play. Uh, we recruited really well that summer. We were fortunate. We had a lot of money from parachute payments still. But we did recruit extremely well for the club. And the club has sold a lot of the players that, that we recruited in that time or are still at the club, which shows how well we did, did recruit. And we, we produced a brilliant team uh, that... You know, won the league and near near the end. It took us time to get going that season. That was the biggest challenge, probably, was uh, putting these players together and, and, and making a team out of so many new players. But once we got going just before Christmas, uh, the second part of the season, we were, we were outstanding. And I absolutely loved my time working with the football club, working with those players. Uh, and it was a, a, a kind of a great introduction into management. But thanks to so many uh, different people. Yeah, so you obviously enjoyed success there, but it kind of turned into rejection towards the end as after 18 months in charge, you were dismissed as the, uh, as the Wigan manager and after the club found themselves in a, in a relegation battle. So talk me through what you were feeling at the time and did you think you could have actually turned things around if given the chance? Yeah, without a doubt. I've, I've, I still speak to the chairman, uh, David Sharp, who who did sack me, and I, I still go back to the club and speak to the chief exec, Jonathan Jackson, and I think like, like football management is really difficult, and there's so many different facets to it now. The, the I think the supporters and social media have created you know this instant success. We went into the championship with a team uh, that just won the league, obviously, but we were in the third to fourth lowest budget in the league, and and nine times out of ten the league placings are, are correlated by, by the budgets and we needed time to, to understand the league to, to the group of players to find their feet in that league and we were just starting to do that but with the way the world is now and especially in football management then you know I paid the price for I mean it wasn't even a disastrous start we were still well in touch within you know to, to mid table uh, we were in the bottom three but uh we were well in touch and it was out of all my kind of time in management, it was the, the biggest disappointment I've had. And like I said, having spoke to people since who were part of that decision, you know, I even think they wish they had made different choices, but that's the, the way things go. That's football management. You, you have to win games of football or you run the risk of, of losing your job. And uh, I learned that very quickly. Yeah. So you're, Managerial career obviously continued uh, shortly after with spells at Chesterfield and then Partick Thistle, uh, where you left the club in September 2019. I mean, what's your next step in terms of uh, your managerial career? Uh, is it a case of waiting for the right offer or are you actively looking to get back you know, involved and further your experience in, manager, uh, in management? Yeah, I'm, I'm actively looking to get back involved in football, whether that's 
you know, a first team coach, an academy coach, an assistant manager, a manager. Uh, I think you, when you become a manager, uh, you get kind of that stigma that he's he just wants to be a manager. But uh, my biggest joy that I got out of managing was was the coaching, was analysing players, analysing teams, and and coaching players to be better. I've I've recently started uh, my own kind of one to one coaching. Uh, and mentoring program for for first team or like uh, first team players, uh, academy players, and also kind of younger kids coaching younger kids. So that is what I love doing is is passing on my experiences and and using my my coaching skills to to help players and to to give back for players. You know to to have that chance to to live a, a career that I had uh, something I really enjoy. So I'm. I'm open to many different offers and, and kind of looking to get, get back in the game soon. Yeah, so just wanted to touch upon uh, one last thing before we head back to Ash uh, for the finale. Um, some of your career highlights, both as a player and now as a manager, came with Wigan. Uh, recently, they were subject to financial issues that ultimately led them relegated back to League One. Um, where do you see the club going from... From here, I mean, amongst the turmoil that they've suffered in recent in recent years, obviously you spoke and we still speak to uh, the chairman now. So, where do you see the club going? I think it's extremely sad what's happened uh, to the club. They had an owner in Dave Whelan who was, you know, one hundred percent for the football club, gave everything to the football club in terms of his time, but also a lot of money as well. Uh, and it's sad that when foreign owners come in, there's there's not that same connection or love or you know from from the local people uh, who who run football clubs. So I think the AFL have a lot to answer for 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 allowing these people to take over the club. And it's so disappointing and sad that a team that second half of the season were outstanding and, and truly deserved to be a championship team next season are not going to be because of other people's, you know, mismanagement and, and allowing uh, teams, uh, a group of people to take over the football club. So it's sad, but whether they do go down or whether, you know, it changes, the club will always come back because they have a fantastic core group of fans that, you know, stick by the club uh, and, and get the club back up. They've done it twice in League One in recent seasons under myself and Paul Cook. Uh, and I'm sure they'll do it again if if they have to. Right then, Gary. Yeah, we come to the end of the show tonight, and it's been it's been hugely insightful to listen to your stories, obviously about the Champions League, playing in the Scottish Premier League, and all sorts. But we are looking for one player to come on this channel, one player that has eluded all of our efforts up to date. Uh, have you ever played with or played against Delhi Adebola? I think I have actually. It's too long ago for me to remember, but I'm pretty sure I played against them when, when I was at Coventry. Uh, it'll be 18 years ago now. Uh, can't remember who he was playing for, but I'm fairly confident. So we can check on Wikipedia later and confirm that. But yeah, I'm pretty sure I have. Definitely have a look at that. But I think Tux has finally got some news with regards to uh, to getting him on the show, haven't you, mate? Yeah, so we have made contact with Delhi. We've spoken to Delhi, um, so it won't be long before um, we have him come on. Um, I won't confirm when he's coming on, um, but he will be coming on um, for one of the last episodes. So it's good to have him tied down. Um, we've signed him. We've got our player. So, yeah. So, hashtag find out Ebola is finally over. That's brilliant news, mate. Can't wait to get him on. Gary, look, whatever happens um, with your future in football, look, all the best, all right? It's been brilliant to, to speak to you tonight. And just thanks for coming on, all right? Brilliant. Thanks very much. Thanks for having us, lads. Cheers, Gary. Cheers, thanks, mate. mate. Cheers. Thank you.